a sign your body's trying to tell you something. So have you ever gotten one of these before? Like they look kind of like a red mole. Well, these actually aren't moles at all. These are cherry angiomonas. Studies have shown that this is typically from a buildup or a prolonged exposure to bromide. Bromide is a known disruptor that prevents iodine from being absorbed in the body, and iodine is crucial for good thyroid health. So what do we do about this? So to displace the bromide, we have to load up on iodine-rich foods. These kelp flakes are an awesome example of an iodine-rich food that you can easily add to anything. Just load up on regular seaweed snacks, which is another awesome iodine-rich food, but this not only helps to displace bromide, but other disruptors such as fluoride and chlorine. So there's a lot, a lot to unpack here. So, okay, let's rewind. We're actually gonna do a little bit of education on cherry angiomas today, which are these red spots that appear on the skin. They are very common. Now the question is, is your bromine or iodine intake playing a role in this? We're gonna find out. <laughs> These are some lofty claims, so we're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive on this, but everything we know about cherry angiomas, here we go. Here we go. So the first question is, what the heck is a cherry angioma? We see these all the time. We're gonna show you some photos of them here, but they appear as little red dots on the skin. They're basically collections of blood vessels. When you look at these under the microscope, you see just a collection of dilated blood vessels. They are incredibly common. I've even developed a few of them myself, very small early stages ones. Everybody can get them. Um, and we see that there is definitely a genetic predisposition to these, it seem to happen in families, but we don't entirely know what causes them, to be honest. Right, and I think that's one of the interesting things. Like we do know some of the gene mutations that occur. So let's say we look at a cherry hemangioma, we look at the DNA of it. Half of them have these kind of DNA mutations and like GNAC or other examples. Now, a lot of this is hereditary. We're born imperfectly, and I think that's why there's a genetic component here, why someone if related to you has them, you may get them as well. And and then that's also why over time you develop them as our cells divide over the course of our lives. They do so imperfectly and they make mistakes. So as we get older, these become more common. It's a combination of genetics and also just our bodies making mistakes. So there was a particular, so this is going to really tie it home. So Dr. Maxfield saw these two patients at a conference. So at this conference, um, a doctor, a collection of doctors get together. This doctor shared a unique experience. They were identical twins. One loved the outdoor. Doors. One was like Dr. Shaw. He just loved being inside, scared to death of the light. And so what they did is they took them side by side, looked at their skin, and the only thing they had in common was actually the cherry hemangiomas on the body. So this is actually something that's not particularly influenced by sun exposure. This is just a product of everything else. Right, and genetics play a large, large role. So not as much the environment as some of the other things that we see on the skin, like lentigos and seborrheic keratoses. So that being said, Let's dive into this video here. So the claim is that it's actually high levels of bromine in the diet that lead to the develop, uh, development of cherry angiomas. Now, that being said, there were some case reports, very low quality evidence um, of just like a few people that had cherry angiomas and then they asked them like, what was in your diet? And they're like, oh, I ate a lot of bromine. And they're like, well, that's what caused it. But what about the 900,000 other exposures you have, including genetics? So the study, I can understand where she came up with this from. So she didn't just like pull it out of thin air. But it's based on very, very, weak evidence. Right. And this is the lowest possible body of evidence. Like this is just pure anecdote in as much as it can scientifically be possible. This is just one person saying I had this. And the reason that they're published though is because maybe it's a rare association. And then once it comes out, more people will come out and say, hey, we had the same association. And then a formal, a real study would be done. Now that's not taking place here. This is just purely coincidence. To help you better understand this association, I came up with this very highly educated, brilliant idea. And this is like similar story. So some people, when they eat Brussels sprouts, they get gassy. It just happens, right? Not me, but it happens. <laughs> Love Brussels sprouts. But that does not mean that if you're gassy, you had Brussels sprouts. So there's this like thought process. Of it's not a two-way streak. So just because these people had bromine and they had cherry hemangiomas does not mean that because they have cherry hemangiomas, you're exposed to bromine. It does not go both ways. Right. And in statistics, if you don't go based on gas analogies, the idea is that cor correlation does not prove causation, right? So if two things are just happening at the same time, doesn't mean that one caused the other, right? So this is really important to note. And I will say, going back to the case report thing, it doesn't make them completely invalid. Dr. Maxfield and I published one of the first case reports on something that we had seen in medicine. And then later on studies show 
that there was a strong association. So the case reports are important, but they're not meaningless, but they don't prove that you should change your diet based on that. Yeah, they have to be taken in context. And this is like we're talking about this more and more in on social media, especially TikTok. People cruise the Internet. They find a study or they find like another website talking about the association, which cites the same study. And they're like, boom, fact, scientific truth. And this is 100 percent not the case. Every single study, even if it's a real study, is taken in the context of pathophysiology, what we know about anatomy and how the body works, and then data from the real world. So this is why, like, again, I said it before, the danger of living off of an abstract. It's a real danger. They're not always real associations. And um, this falls into that same sort of niche nuance category. Right. And to say that the 100 patients I see a week that have cherry angiomas all have issues with bromine and iodine in their diets would just plainly be false. So it's definitely not a strong correlation if there is one. Okay, so now the next claim in this has to do with thyroid function and iodine. So we're gonna give her a, a check plus on this one um, because if you have not enough iodine in your diet, you will have low thyroid function. In fact, actually, it, she suggests that maybe you should just like load up on a bunch of iodine in order to offset this imbalance that you have. And I would suggest that you don't do that because it, in fact, there's something called the wolf takeoff effect, where if you load someone's system with a ton of iodine, it actually shuts off the thyroid function. So it's actually like this paradoxical effect where you would think you need iodine to make thyroid hormone, but if you overload the thyroid, with iodine, it actually paradoxically shuts off the thyroid. And so I would suggest not loading your system with iodine. Right, absolutely. It's everything in moderation. That's why when we're talking about supplements, there's always like a little bit of skepticism and a little bit of like a lot of bit of background physiology because it's never like just take an insane amount of one thing and all your problems will be solved. Same thing here, if you load up on a specific substrate that your body utilizes, the effects aren't always gonna be positive. So to kind of go back to this video, mostly false, um, just total misinformation. And I don't, we don't blame the career, we never do, because you know you get your information from sources and they're often they're often amplified on certain people's websites or we even like, like when I Googled this um, and it showed up, like the first website that came up actually validated what she was saying. But then when you dive into that website, it's not a legitimate source. And so people are just getting their information from bad sources. So we of course don't blame this person for putting that information out there. It's just like, is not accurate based on what we know about cherry and geomas? Yeah, and honestly, like I, I also don't blame anyone who viewed it and believes it her included because we have so much information available to us right now. It's very difficult to sift through it. But additionally, the most simple explanation is often the easiest one to believe. And so when we talk about all this background science and all this pathway, this pathway, this pathway, it's hard to communicate that succinctly and effectively to where a person just doesn't tune it out. And I think actually as a doctor, that's one of the biggest struggles to do is, especially in the social media setting, is take a complicated scenario because we know things and studied things from the cellular level to how they work as the whole body and a system, but then to shrink that all back and communicate it in 10 words is difficult to do. So yeah, and that's what we try to do on this channel is make science simple, but sometimes it's, it's really just not that simple. Okay, so now the question is, you have cherry angioma, mostly due to just bad luck in genetics. Um, I have them too. What are you gonna do about it? We do have treatments in dermatology. We see these all the time. Now you have to decide if it's worth it. If you have a thousand cherry angiomas, are you gonna treat them all? Maybe not, maybe you wanna treat them. There are several treatment options. Um, in the office we can do, and we'll show you some examples of this. We can use like electrodesiccation or electrofulguration to basically just burn these cherry angiomas. And by burning them, it kills those blood vessels and then healthy new skin cells come in and that cherry angioma goes away. So another thing that you can do is actually use a laser and lasers that target vessels or vascular lasers. So your PDL, your KTP, your IPL, they target blood vessels and basically target that color or chromophore and they help eliminate them. So you treat it, it zaps it, it explodes the vessel, it coagulates off and then the vessel dies off and goes away. And so we do have several treatments in dermatology to get rid of these if you're concerned about them. And so I always try to caveat this in when we talk about vessel growths because a lot of people, they are bothered by this or other sort of vessels and they want to find a topical that will work for them just candidly and I always try to give you the best information possible. You're probably not going to get a meaningful result from anything topical that you see or would want to buy for these. Unfortunately, procedures only, only way to correct this structural change in the body. 
Absolutely. So this is a common thing where people are like, what can I do to get rid of it? You could use makeup to cover it up, but a lot of times these are going to be elevated. So truly, and honestly, you'll get the biggest bang for your buck because these treatments being a permanent solution for this redness is actually not that unaffordable for people to just have a single treatment. And a lot of times one, two, sometimes three treatments to get rid of it if you're really concerned about it. So they respond pretty quickly to treatments. And so just know that you have that option out there and it's not an unaffordable treatment option. And then just one last thought here, I just make, if it really does bother you a lot, make sure you communicate that to your dermatologist. Cause sometimes when we see people's skin, we're like so cancer focused. We're like, you know, benign spot, benign spot, benign spot. No, this is a benign spot. Don't worry about it. If it bothers you, please let us know. Be like, this is important to me. I'm willing to invest money into getting this taken care of or invest effort into getting this taken care of because then we can work with you. We just have to know it's important to you first. That's a really good point. And this kind of goes back to the way that him and I were trained. Um, so we were trained by people with a little a bit more of a conservative mindset. And so they want it. They, we're not the, we, we didn't train somewhere where they sell you a lot of products or they upsell you on cosmetic procedures. Like almost everyone we do any procedure on, they come to us asking for those procedures. So we're not in the business of upselling people. And that just goes back to how we were trained. And a lot of times if you're coming to see us and you have Jerry Angiomas, we'll tell you what they are. Um, but we, we won't offer treatment for them unless you're concerned about them. And so what I usually say in my dialogue is this is a cherry angioma, completely benign. You don't have to do anything for it. If you're interested in treatment. We do have treatments for them. Just let us know if you're interested. And then I just go through the rest of my skin check. And so just know there are treatment options out there, but you don't have to treat them. The last thing I want to say about this is that if you have an abnormal growth on your skin and it's pink and it's red and it's new, don't just think it's cherry angioma. If you're concerned about it, make sure you get it checked out by a dermatologist. We have things called amelanotic melanomas. We have Merkel cell carcinomas. We have all kinds of growths on the skin. You don't want to write off something that's bleeding, new, growing rapidly. Um, it could be anything, right? So there are a lot of other examples of things, pyogenic granulomas. There are a lot of things that can look like this that aren't quite this. And so just be cautious. Um, don't watch a video and just think, uh, that you know what it is exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think it's super important. You know, I think the benefit of social media is people are aware of a lot of common things, but the problem is not everything is that common thing. And for that exceptional person, it's important to get the right diagnosis. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Please like, comment, and subscribe. We'll see you in the next video. We'll see you next time.